the Institute of International Affairs, NUPI. And I am also the, um, the principal investigator of, uh, of the Horizon 2020 funded project, uh, Prevex, Preventing Violent Extremism in the, in the Balkans and the broader MENA region. And I'm very happy that we are having this seminar today, uh, where we will be fo focusing and reviewing how the EU and its member states are implementing uh, strategies to prevent violent extremism and how the cooperation is going between, uh, between the EU member states, but also uh, in the states where this is taking place. We will focus on EU implementation, weaknesses and challenges of um, counterterrorism and uh, preventing violent extremism strategies in Western Balkans and the MENA region to identify best practices and lessons learned. And with me today is uh, Stephen Blockman, Director of uh, Research at the Center for European Policy Studies, CEPS. Uh, Stephen is also the leader of the work package four in uh, Prevex on uh, EU prevention strategies and he will uh, give us an overview of current policy developments in light of what has recently happened uh, for example uh, in uh, Paris and Nice. With me is also Professor Diana Mishkova. She's a professor of uh, Balkan history and director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Sofia. Uh, Diana also leads uh, Prevex Work Package 5 on preventing, preventing violent extremism in the Balkans. We also have with us uh, Erik uh, Skare. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for International Studies at the Sciences Po in Paris. Erik is deeply involved in the Prevex Work Package 7 on the Middle East. Um, and he is also about to publish a book with the Cambridge University Press uh, uh, entitled uh, The History of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So Eric should be well suited to the task that he's working on in uh, Prevex. We also uh, are so lucky to have with us uh, uh, um, two commentators. We have uh, Anna Ries, which is a senior counterterrorism expert in the European Union External Action Service. And we have Philippe de Koenig, a regional uh, counterterrorism security advisor in EEAS for the Western Balkans, based in Sarajevo. Uh, we are now almost a year into Prevex. Uh, we have the, uh, a project which studies violent extremism and how it can best be uh, prevented in the Balkans in the North Africa and the Sahel and in uh, the Middle East more properly, the uh, more properly defined. We are looking at what the EU and other stakeholders are doing and how their activities, programs and projects and policies within the field of preventing uh, violent extremism is fitting not only with realities on the ground, but also how these policies are received and perceived in the various area where the EU tries to get these strategies, policies and projects to work. And what we will be discussing today is some uh, very uh, recent forthcoming uh, deliverables from the Prevex uh, project, where we have looked at both developments on the EU side and how these are implemented in the various regions that Prevex is working. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussion today. And um, in order not to waste time, I will give the floor now to uh, Professor Stephen Blockmans. Stephen, please. Thank you, Morten. And um, very good to see you all here on the screen and uh, those that are still flowing into uh, the participant to the virtual audience. Overall, I think um, the PV agenda of the European Union is, is quite a recent uh, phenomenon, also in most member states, and it principally aims at preventing violent Islamist extremism through community engagement. We all know that the, the UK has been a pioneer, of course, in developing a prevent pillar as part of its uh, 2003 counterterrorism strategy and has since 
actively contributed to the development also of an EU level uh, PVE framework. It is this EU framework which has in turn pushed other member states like Ireland, Spain, to develop their own national PVE strategies in recent years. Spain, of course, has contributed enormously uh, to the EU's efforts in the wake of the Madrid uh, bombings. Whereas Germany and other member states have also over the past decade made significant strides in preventing involvement in extremism um, and have brought their national practices to the EU level. France, another country which uh, we focus on in, uh, in our research, uh, generally favored a more securitized rather than a preventive approach. I'm not sure if that's um, a widely shared um, uh, notion in, in France, but um, I'm open for discussing this. What I would rather do than, uh, than trying to regurgitate some of the institutional and procedural and strategies which have been adopted since 2003, since uh, we already devoted a paper on that <clears throat> earlier this year, um, we have a basis for that. I would rather uh, focus on some of the recent developments in this particular field before we venture into uh, the regional studies, because we have had, again, a spate of terrorist attacks, of course, on the homeland, in France mainly, and <clears throat> on the back of uh, three terrorist attacks in end of October um, to the middle of November, European Council President Charles Michel and uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen have in several speeches highlighted uh, at the one hand, the sanctity of, of the freedom of religion and, um, and, and freedom of expression, um, and at the same time explained that without security, those values uh, cannot be protected. And uh, Michel in particular has highlighted how the priority nevertheless is security, but at the same time it is crucial to replace this circle of hate and mistrust with dialogue, understanding, and, and, and trust indeed. But his recipe for engendering uh, European values, in particular among the youth and also migrant uh, populations, is combined with a fight against hate, uh, as he called it, that should help us all you know, in, in preventing radicalization. He has, however, been criticized in the European Parliament, in the press, uh, for his rather narrow-minded proposal to incorporate these principles in the Islam training by setting up um, one or more educational uh, training institutes or a network of such institutes for training imams. And his proposals have also raised concerns with several governments of the EU member states, Netherlands, Sweden, Spain, Italy, Luxembourg, um, and since then, well, mainly because they thought that the idea seemed to take into consideration as the objective of counterterrorism only Islam. And they wanted to see that more, much more broadly, of course. And as a result, the, those declarations have also been tweaked to include the growing threat posed by, for example, far right groupings, a phenomenon that we see, of course, within the EU member states, but also in the Balkans. President von der Leyen of the European Commission has urged implementation on three levels, prevention, protection of the external borders, and action. And in a way, this particular webinar comes a few days too early um, to, to, to present, you know, the, or to discuss the European Commission's uh, initiatives in this respect, because on the 9th of December, the Commission is expected to present a new European agenda on combating terrorism which is going to focus on those three elements, prevention, protection of external borders and action. Um, and uh, in all in effort, you know, to prevent radicalization and better protect public spaces by um, dealing with the root causes, uh, investing in advancement opportunities, inclusion, commonality to create what they call a, the commission calls a prospect for, of the future, a new European action plan for integration and inclusion was already presented on the 24th of November. Uh, the JHA Council, uh, where member states agreed uh, that there's a need to improve social cohesion in, in Europe, um, basically uh, framed it as integration as a two-way street 
effort from the migrants as well as support from uh, the European Union. And this resonates also in the, the regional approaches, of course, that the EU has adopted towards the Balkans, uh, less so to the MENA region, even though actions uh, are inspired by those, um, by that principle, I think. There is the development and strengthening of European anti-radicalization networks. Um, people in the field of which we have one on the call, uh, dealing with preventing radicalization, especially again in, in youths, um, also teachers, police officers, social workers, uh, physicians. Um, a third priority area for the, that the European Commission and uh, other institutions have put forward is um, is concerns the internet as a source of radicalization, where it is crucial to take down content as soon as possible. And here, um, there's a need, of course, to adopt a commission proposal introduced in 2018 on preventing terrorist online content. And here too, I think there, there are further uh, policy developments to be expected, especially when uh, the Digital Services Act is adopted. Um, this is um, expected um, later this month, uh, although it has been delayed already a number of times. The last priority mentioned also by Ursula von der Leyen is on the external border protection, where at the end of November, uh, the first Schengen Forum took place to assess, again, strengths and weaknesses on this particular front, uh, where a new strategy is to be expected to be adopted in March 2021. Um, part of it, uh, which will strengthen Eurodact as well as Europol by increasing their competences um, and accessibility to, to information. But first of all, uh, the gaps in the Schengen information system will be addressed in, in, in the package, which is uh, to be adopted later this week on the 9th of December. Um, now, all of this is, is basically driven by a longer term agenda, which was accelerated by these recent um, attacks on, on, on the homeland. What is key, I think, to, to distill from these is that prevention um, of radicalization, violent extremism is really put uh, front and center, uh, you could argue, in all of these um, activities. So this is very much um, in between the two years of uh, uh, the EU family, uh, if you want. Um, and so before we, we go into venturing into you know, uh, some of the findings from our regional research, um, which of course spell out these aspects in, in much greater detail and also bring funding online for um, the implementation of projects that build capacities for the networks concerned, for, um, for training concerned. I think it is, it is crucial to, to keep in mind what the compass of the European Union as a collective is. Um, driven a bit more, it seems, uh, still by a securitization in, uh, in, in later years, thereby giving greater voice perhaps on the EU level by the French approach, um, as we've seen uh, to have developed over the last couple of uh, years. I'll stop my introductory remarks here, Morten. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to come in with uh, additional points during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, very, very interesting. And um, I have to just make a small apology to the audience that I forgot to say that we, of course, very much would like to share is their uh, interact, uh, that they interact with us. So I would urge uh, everybody in our audience to use the Q&A function in Zoom to, uh, to, uh, to post uh, questions and comments to these presentations. So we will uh, very much uh, looking forward to also opening it up to the floor uh, um, as we move along in the seminar. But first we will have the introductory remarks. So without further ado, I will I turn to you, Diana. Please, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Stephen, for initiating this, this webinar. And hello to, to our, uh, for the time being, invisible uh, audience. Um, I will now present as, as briefly as I can uh, the very preliminary results of the work package five dealing with uh, preventing uh, violent extremism in, uh, in the Balkans. 
Um, these are indeed preliminary remarks, and unfortunately, due to the pandemic situation, we were still, until now, unable to conduct that um, part of our work, the major part, the most crucial part of our work, connected with um, infield um, investigation. Um, now, uh, our our study of, of the Western Balkans um, practically focuses on, um, includes Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, Serbia. Um, perhaps the most uh, uh, conspicuous common characteristic of all these countries in the last couple of decades uh, related to the uh, to, to uh, violent extremism is the foreign fighter phenomenon. Foreign fighters, veterans of the Afghan Jihad, uh, began to arrive, originally arrive in Bosnia in the summer of 92, and their number increased to several thousand in the next three years. Since 2012, however, the direction was uh, has been reversed. Over 1,070 nationals of Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Albania, Serbia and Montenegro made their way to Syria and Iraq with the aim to join mostly the ranks of the uh, Islamic State and to a lesser extent Al-Qaeda affiliates. Other overall estimates uh, reach 1,353 men, women, and children from the Western Balkans traveling to Syria and Iraq. From the outset of the Syrian conflict, the countries that registered some of the highest rates of jihadi mobilization in Europe are Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and North Macedonia. In the last years, domestic governments have taken substantial measures prosecuting those who traveled to join a foreign military or paramilitary group and sought to discourage others to travel. Currently, the Western Balkans is the region with the highest number of returned foreign fighters in Europe. Besides the EU, other external stakeholders have pursued their own strategies in the region, developing competitive and partially overlapping approaches to preventing and countering violent extremism. Most instrumental has been the role of the United States, the United Nations through its United Nations Development Program, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as some local civil society organizations and donors representing nation states such as UK and Germany. In addition, external stakeholders include institutions based in the Muslim majority world, such as the Turkish Diyanet or the Hedaya. Although Western Balkan countries as such have rarely been the target of terrorist attacks inspired by Al-Qaeda uh, uh, Al and the Islamic State, the kind of radicalization and uh, violent extremism spread throughout the region together with the export of foreign fighters turned the attention of the EU and other external and domestic stakeholders to Islamist uh, violent uh, extremism. Now, the EU strategy towards um, uh, VE in the Western Balkans is spelled out in the EU Directive 541 of the European Parliament and of the Council of 15 of March 2017 on combating terrorism, which replaced Council framework decision from 22, sorry, from 2002, and amended another Council decision from 2005. It envisages uh, countering radicalization by, I quote, promoting even more vigorously good governance, human rights, democracy, as well as education and economic prosperity and enga engage in conflict resolution. Next to fostering certain legal reforms, the EU has funded a great number of research projects and raising awareness initiatives, particularly in Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. The EU is looking to expand the Radicalization Awareness Network RAN to include the Western Balkans effectively integrating practitioners from the region and the EU-based network of, of 6,000 academics and policymakers working on uh, PCVE and creating more exchange among Western Balkans practitioners themselves. 
the EU possesses a, ses, a, set of, um, a set of comparative advantages when it comes to influencing the P PVE policies of uh, Western Balkan states. The EU enlargement and integration process is instrumental as an incentive for most of the countries to undertake various reforms, including implementation of preventive measures. This can be observed most clearly in the examples of two countries currently seeking to enter the negotiation process, Albania and uh, the Republic of uh, North Macedonia. Interestingly, there are uh, um, um, important differences in the projects and programs funded by the US and the EU, mainly due, however, to the different tools available. Well, this is a, a hypothesis that it's really due to different tools available. Because whereas the US supports PCVE initiatives for state and non-state actors, as well as co countering terrorism initiatives addressed to the respective directorate and intelligence agencies, the EU focuses mainly on the PCVE measures. In the opinion of a EU official, this is because the EU lacks an army or intelligence agency and has only Euro Euro Europol uh, available to support uh, countering terrorism initiatives. At the same time, considering the strong involvement of both the US and the EU in PCV initiatives, funding opportunities from different donor organizations often overlap, either because of similar objectives or because of many donors targeting one and the same community. Moreover, due to the high number of organizations involved in community-based PCV actions, it sometimes seems as if every organization is reinventing the wheel by developing and implementing similar one-time initiatives rather than one organization rolling out a specific initiative at a larger scale. During the last years, EU seeks to play an increasingly significant role by pursuing bilateral ar arrangements with all Western Balkan countries. One can summarize the priority action envisaged by bilateral agreements as follows. First, addressing challenges posed by returning foreign terrorist fighters and their families. This includes systematic investigation and prosecution of criminal acts committed by foreign terrorist fighters, disengagement, rehabilitation and reintegration programs inside and outside prisons, sharing of available information on returning foreign terrorist fighters with EU member states. Second, stepping up activities in the field of prevention and countering violent extremism. This includes training local practitioners such as teachers, police, social workers, representatives of religious communities to detect and address violent extremist tendencies, as well as developing effective, effective strategic communication campaigns and putting in place a multi-agency approach that includes civil society organizations. Third, Measures concerning money laundering and terrorism financing. I will not tell, uh, uh, I'll not stop here. Uh, supporting structural measures such as creating national coordinators for counterterrorism and for preventing and violent um, uh, for preventing violent extremism to review national strategies for the prevention and countering terrorism, improve threat assessment analysis and implement the coordination mechanisms for new local projects. In some cases, such as Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina, the agreements address specifically the need for rehabilitation and reintegration of the returning foreign terrorist fighters in and out of prison. These arrangements, these agreements rather, had served, bilateral agreements had served as the basis for the national governments to adopt national strategies on preventing uh, violent extremism and countering terrorism which in the ideal case uh, should have uh, included uh, at least four strategic objectives, early identification, prevention, intervention, and de-radicalization and reintegration. At the same time, there is an increasing, increasing demand to study the enabling environments to position the radicalization process within formative political and discursive landscapes. Policymakers, practitioners, and state stakeholders increasingly advocate a whole of society approach 
to denote preventing and countering violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorism, envision, envisioning a role for multiple sectors and civil society actors in various preventions, interventions, and rehabilitation programs. Now, if I, on the basis of what we had done so far, and it's not really much, uh, our very preliminary recommendations uh, considering, uh, could be the following, uh, considering that, that um, uh, also the fact that an increasingly significant external stakeholder, even, even though it is an extremely, uh, increasingly significant external stakeholder, the EU is still the second after the US throughout the region uh, in, in involved in, this, in these measures. Overall, it seems that there is little coordination of the PCV efforts by the various international actors and external, external stakeholders. Improvements can be achieved along the following major tracks. The EU could seek stronger interaction and or collaboration with other external stakeholders in the field of PCV, the US as well as the international organization such as the UN and the OSCE. This will achieve a high degree of synergy and complementarity. To achieve longer term sustainability, the EU preventive measures and strategies need to target not only the already radicalized individuals and groups, but to address more comprehensively the enabling environments based on an analysis of both occurrence and non-occurrence of VE. There is an increasing demand for a balance, for example, between prevention and intervention. Third, while continuing its PCV efforts, the EU should consider more effectively the reintegration and, re and de-radicalization, including among returnees and former prisoners convicted of VE in collaboration with the national Western Balkan governments. Finally, the EU should pay more attention to the monitoring and assessment of the ongoing and past PCVE initiatives, its own, those of the, of the other stakeholders and national strategies, not only to avoid duplication and overlapping, uh, overlapping work, but also to guarantee their long-term effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, very interesting. And uh, several uh, important points that you made that, that I hope that we will get back to in the, the, when we reach the discussion phase of the, of the webinar. And I would also uh, once more urge uh, all our participants to make use of the Q&A uh, Function. I think there has been uh, much uh, food for thought in the two interventions so far. Uh, with that said, uh, we will now turn to uh, Eric Skore. Eric, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Morten, and thank you for the opportunity to present our findings on the USPV approach in the Middle East. Um, so these are only preliminary findings, but so far it's uh, quite certain that it's difficult to outline one particular method or one point of focus when analyzing the EU's PVE approach in the Middle East. And it ranges from empowering youth leaders to securing airports and borders. Um, it ranges from training law enforcement and intelligence to stifling the financing of terrorist organizations or rehabilitating children born in or recruited to the Islamic State, uh, producing counter narratives to strengthening religious institutions or improving strategic communication. And all of these efforts are implemented while uh, stressing, the, uh, uh, stressing the necessity of good governance, human rights, and democracy and dialogue with key partners in the region. Um, of course, all of these various approaches are not the result of a defined political line by the EU in its PVE approach, but rather what is deemed feasible, possible, and most urgent in the eyes of EU policymakers and its, its key partners in the region. Um, for example, while PVE cooperation with Jordan and Lebanon is described as cordial by EU representatives, it is far less extensive um, with Egypt, uh, partly because the EU is uh, particularly wary of the authoritarian turn of the Assisi regime, 
uh, and because they don't share the same definition of violent extremism. I mean, many of the regimes in the Middle East operate with a highly politicized definition of violent extremism uh, to criminalize or at best to delegitimize domestic opposition. In Egypt, it would be the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, it is also less extensive cooperation with Saudi Arabia, uh, although the PVE approach there is mainly with security or intelligence because it would be preposterous to talk about any strong civil society in Saudi Arabia to cooperate with due to the repression. Um, so to summarize, the EU can only do what the main power players in the region allow the EU to do there. Um, similarly, the EU does not provide any specific working definition of violent extremism or terrorism in the Middle East. I mean, what violent extremism is and is not, and what groups it includes or excludes. Um, although, given the events and groups mentioned in the CT documents and council conclusions from 2005 to 2020, it is quite obvious that the EU is referring to Sunni extremism in general, and to groups affiliated with Islamic State and Al-Qaeda in particular. Um, I suppose there are two main reasons why the EU avoids providing a specific definition or it be, um, two reasons for its vagueness. And one is, as I suppose Dr. Blockman um, mentioned, is that there is no agreement among EU member states what uh, terrorism or violent extremism is, or what the best PVE approach is. Um, the EU is also quite wary of not alienating key partners in the region, which, as mentioned, operates with um, a highly politicized definition. Um, despite all this, I mean, our preliminary finding so far is that the EU has moved towards a security first centered PVE approach in the Middle East the last decade. And it's and it is correspondingly de declining as a normative power, focusing mainly on spreading democracy, human rights, or good governance in the region. Um, so we are, in fact, witnessing the gradual transition towards an increasingly realist-oriented security paradigm, which undermines the other concerns of the EU in the region. Um, this is not mainly, this is, partly based on the PVE funding projects of the EU in the region. I mean, securitization or PVE funding project focusing on securitization receives by far the most funding. Um, it is also based uh, on the fact that the logic of the PVE logic of the EU is, is increasingly blurred. Uh, and what I mean by that is that Although you have PVE funding projects focusing on good governance or societal cohesion, such as youth empowerment, women's rights, etc., it is not implemented as a virtue in itself. Um, the EU is not building schools for the sake of building schools because it's a good thing or because it creates better societies, but it is uh, carried out to prevent violent extremism now, uh, which was mentioned by several representatives from the EU's external action service. Um, so, um, and this focus on securitization and this focus on preventing violent extremism in the Middle East does cause cognitive dissonance and issues on the ground for many of the implementing partners. First, many of the implementing partners uh, in, on, in, on the ground, which works on the EU's PVE funding projects, noted that they did not perceive what they were doing as PVE efforts, although it was categorized by the EU as such. Uh, secondly, many implementing partners avoided telling their target groups that their projects were PVE related in fear of alienating their target population. As they said, most often they had to say it was peace building or to create understanding, religious or ethnic uh, understanding in communities uh, because it did not alienate. I mean, if they were supposed to tell their target population that you are in danger of be becoming radicalized, you are in danger of becoming terrorist, obviously it would not work. Um, 
uh, also there is a there should be a preliminary finding is that there should be some focus on economic class um, because the EU is I should be fair in saying that the EU is focusing also very much on societal cohesion and in particularly so on youth empowerment uh, but the question is nevertheless if the youth empowerment project um, targets a representative cross-section of the youth population in the region and many implementing partners noted that uh, the youth uh, participating in the PVE projects did in fact require some social capital, some education and some language skills. Um, for example, if they were supposed to participate in debating events or uh, international events, etc. Um, so the main, the main, so if I'm going to conclude, I would say that um, the EU is, is increasingly turned to a securitization approach, uh, which is most likely counterproductive in the sense that it alienates and uh, alienates the target population and also uh, possibly stigmatizes uh, communities and particularly so the Sunni communities in Lebanon and Iraq because that's where the EU's PV approach is mainly centered. Um, I think I will conclude there, but I'm of course available for further questions or comments in the Q&A session. Thank you. Eric, um, that was uh, great. Um, let me now uh, turn to uh, our two uh, commentaries. Uh, first, I would like to call upon uh, Anna Ries, uh, senior counterterrorism expert in the European Union External Action Service. Anna, please, would you uh, be so kind to uh, let us uh, hear your comments on what you have heard? Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, colleagues. Can you uh, see me? Oh, I can't see myself, which probably is a good thing. Um, anyway, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, for, for your efforts. So um, just to perhaps start uh, uh, the reverse end, what Eric was referring to on on um, the use approach on PVE globally and uh, men and Western Balkans, etc. Um, I just want to underscore that we operate under the policy of do no harm. So, so uh, obviously, uh, programs has to be adjusted to avoid uh, causing harms and stigmatizing populations, as you say. Is there a risk? Absolutely. Are we realizing that we need to do much more on, the, on, on gender, i.e. different methods as regards women versus men? Absolutely. So it's, a, it's an evolving uh, skill set, uh, which is... Uh, uh, and some organizations are better than others. And you may have heard of these latest things called um, behavioral insight, which is something uh, where they try to more in depth uh, work on how certain behaviors are created. It's also uh, a bit academic at present, but it's also something you do on, on children joining um, uh, army groups, et cetera, or forcefully join armed groups and how you de radicalize. Going to the Western Balkans, as you know, and, and we have Philippe so I don't want to take away his thunder, who's our main man in the region, uh, who has done a tremendous job. So as you know, the European Union or the ES notably has uh, deployed 17 um, CT experts around the globe and, and I wouldn't say hotspots, but relevant sectors where CT needed to be further strengthened. I, we have then the competence in the delegation to further guide programs, as well as connect much better with the security authorities in, in the countries. Um, so lots have happened uh, in the Western Balkans. Um, and, and of course, a couple of things to underscore. The Western Balkans is of course on the pathway some point to the EU, hence they have to fulfill far, uh, much higher thresholds in terms of legislation than if, if you compare to, to example to MENA. Second of all, they are right on our doorstep. And uh, thirdly, there is a huge community of diaspora inside the European Union. There we see very strong links on radicalization, I should mention. So, so radicalization uh, has happened in the region, but a lot has also happened from diaspora inside the European Union. So there are very strong links in that regard. Um, in terms of what um, Diana said on recommendations, so on and so forth, I think, I think we are uh, 
on paper and on money allocation, donor allocation, doing a lot of these things. There's been a lot of training of teachers. We have deployed um, peer-to-peer -peer groups, uh, European Union experts, two teachers, two psychologists, and more, more will happen in that area. But what I see for myself, uh, and mind you, Philip can, can uh, comment much, much better because he's on the ground. But what we, we like to see is actual implementation. So now we've done a lot of training, we had a lot of conferences, and now things need to happen. And we see also in some of the countries that uh, whilst on the government level, they are fantastic uh, national CD strategies and plans and action plans and et cetera. How do they actually translate down to the individual village? This is really where, you know, the raisin in the pudding, we can say now before Christmas, uh, this is the real key where you actually implement and it comes down to the individual local um, authorities in, in the context of the Western Balkans, I mean municipal authorities. Another big issue we have raised uh, through Philippe with our counterparts is also that, because um, you do know a lot of uh, imprisoned uh, foreign terrorist fighters uh, who returned early in particular are being released also in Europe, but also in the Western Balkans. And if you put it in the context of what happened in Austria recently, uh, it's in a crucial area. So what happens with these prisoners when they're released? Uh, first question for us who deals with the more hardcore security is, is the local police informed? It needs to be without a shadow of a doubt, there needs to be a very direct line between probation services and the local police authorities. Then, of course, it needs to be a long uh, process before that from probation services with the local authorities. What's going to happen with this individual? Where is he, in most cases he, but some women as well, planning to go? Will they go back to the village where they were already radicalized? Will they stay with their previous family? Will they be welcome there? So there are lots of practical aspects that we need, need to look at. And an area where the authorities have flagged, particularly those Notably, I would say Kosovo, for example, have taken and Bosnia has taken a large amount of, of returnees, is the issue with um, the children born in the region, the problems with not having birth certificates. So Daesh issue this uh, nonsense birth certificates obviously have no value in, in, in a normal democracy. So that needs to be issued, um, et cetera. So there's a lot of small practical things that needs to happen in order for, for a child to be enrolled in school and so on and so forth. Um, I think um, I think I stop there actually and let um, Philippe uh, give a more colorful full, uh, impression from from the ground. I think as always, I sit here in Brussels headquarters by my former field uh, person. I think it's so easy for us to sit and dictate what others should do. And uh, whereas, you know, um, the resources we have in the European Union, in terms of social, social services, health, authority, health services, et cetera, et cetera, it's so different from the situation in, in, for example, the Western Balkans, that we need to also be very realistic with what we expect them to do and um, adjust our expectations and objectives in accordance with the resources that are available on the ground. And this is what we're trying to do, to plug, really plug with them the holes, the gaps that are missing. And they always say to us, please don't do any more conferences. No more fancy conferences and hotels. We are so done with that, you know. But we do need um, psychiatrists. And that, I'm afraid, we have not been able to be, be able to provide. So meaning my country, Sweden, will lend two post-trauma psychiatrists to the region. Because uh, people are busy at home, in their own countries, with their own returnees. So anyway, I leave it there and pass over to Philippe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'll pass the floor straight on to Philippe. Uh, Philippe, you're on, please. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Anna, and, and uh, good afternoon to, to all of you, uh, the listeners, and also the people from, from the panel. So thank you very much for this uh, first uh, preliminary uh, assessment and and uh, some recommendations so uh, let me give you some okay some some ideas and some remarks first reflections from uh, field level uh, first of all i think 
it's important to explain that uh, European Union, uh, if we are talking about PCVE, uh, we do uh, working on all forms of extremism. Uh, and this is very important to stress this. Although it can look like, uh, because of the situation, and it was mentioned before, that more than 1,000 foreign terrorist fighters left the region. So uh, let's say uh, Islamic uh, extremism uh, was uh, a lot in the focus. But nevertheless, we are uh, trying to work on all forms of uh, extremism and radicalism. Then secondly, I have to say that the European Union, uh, when it comes to the Western Balkan, I can only talk about the Western Balkan, uh, we, we have a quite exceptional framework uh, concerning CT and, and PCVE. There is, first of all, an EU strategy uh, for the Western Balkan uh, with some annexes and also an annex on uh, security. And uh, let's say as a result of this uh, EU strategy for the Western Balkans, uh, we have a unique uh, joint uh, EU-Western Balkan uh, action plan signed by uh, the commissioner in, in, from the EU, but also by all the, the ministers of interior from the Western Balkan, uh, working around six uh, objectives on CT and, and CVE, uh, and, and let's say the six uh, main uh, objectives. And uh, in order to refine, because this was quite um, abstract, and in order to refine this, we have a unique six CT arrangements uh, on paper with concrete uh, activities uh, between the EU on the one side and commitments from the EU, but also commitments from the six Western Balkan countries, uh, where we have defined uh, almost in, in quite detailed some activities concerning CT and PVE. If you compare this to other regions of the world, I think this is unique that the European Union has this with the Western Balkan. So I can say there is a lot of uh, commitment from both sides uh, to do something on these issues. Uh, we also have to say that situation nowadays, uh, talking about countering terrorism, countering violent extremism, uh, has changed if you compare it to 2012, 2013. Now uh, we cannot deny we are facing and we are challenged by returning foreign terrorist fighters and this is not an, an abstract challenge, this is a concrete challenge. These people are coming back, were uh, foreign fighters with family members, women and children. So also the regional authorities are faced with that. And that's why uh, it is a real, and it has to be a priority for the Western Balkan authorities and also for Europe to work uh, on this resocialization, rehabilitation and uh, reintegration issues. Uh, I heard some uh, recommendations on coordination. Uh, yes, coordination is a big issue and it's a very difficult issue because uh, everybody wants to do something. A lot of people are doing a lot of things and, and it's all with good intention. Uh, I can tell you that there is at the national level, the level of HQ, uh, regular uh, coordination meetings between, for instance, the EU on one side and the US on the other side. Uh, there is the same between the EU and the United Nations. At the local level, we have, uh, let's say, informal coordination mechanisms where we are coming together with all uh, the stakeholders on, on uh, PCVE, where we are trying uh, to do our best to see who is doing what and, and what, is, what are the real needs. Uh, we have also quite unique uh, coordination mechanism uh, as you know, I'm, I'm chairing uh, the regional network of national coordinators. Uh, at the request of the European Union, the regional authorities has uh, appointed each national coordinator for CT and CVE. And uh, we are gathering these six people uh, twice a year, where we are discussing exactly the implementation of their own CT uh, strategies and CT action plans. So this is quite a successful uh, coordination mechanism in the region. And then last but not least, uh, we have also uh, put in place uh, IISG, which is uh, in charge to do a mapping exercise. Uh, so to make visible who is doing what on CT and CVE, 
not only in the EU funded projects, but, but also uh, within the international community, not only to make uh, a mapping, but also to make a kind of evaluation, kind of assessment and coming up with recommendations on how to do it better. Uh, another point I heard was uh, there has to be balance between CT and CVE. Uh, I agree, and, and I think it, it's like that. I, I think the US, for instance, is more doing the hardcore CT uh, issues, and we are doing more the soft uh, issues. This is based, I think, on our personal uh, experience, uh, and also we may not forget that the hardcore CT issues is, is, uh, uh, is an issue for the member states. I mean, within the European Union, we don't have uh, operational uh, uh, departments who are working on this. So that's why we are focusing mainly on prevention. On the other hand, I have to say, uh, especially in the Western Balkan, we may not forget that prevention is key. And prevention uh, is even more important than in, in Western Europe, because here, at any cost, we have really to, to make sure that uh, attacks like we have seen in Paris and, and, and in Vienna uh, we must make sure that this is not happening here. And, and I think we were lucky so far uh, the last uh, years, really, there were no uh, terrorist attacks in the region. And, and I think it's very good because we, we cannot foresee what uh, the result should be of a major attack here. Uh, I'm always saying where in Western Europe it, it united the people uh, almost if there is an attack uh, against this small minority of wrongdoers. Uh, we we are not sure uh, to, um, until what that can lead in, in the Western Balkans. So here prevention is uh, even more uh, important than uh, within Europe. And then uh, last point uh, that I want to, to comment, uh, monitoring assessment of projects. Uh, yes, it is, it is very important. First, if I want to, to talk about projects, you may not forget that the European Union, we have maybe not so many CT and PVE specific projects, but we have a lot of C PVE relevant projects. And these are also very important. And sometimes we are forgetting that these uh, CT relevant projects, for instance, uh, projects on uh, economy, on, on employment, on, on the well being of youngsters. Uh, although this is not a specific C CTE project, uh, it is very important. So if we are making assessments and if we are monitoring, we must uh, take into account also these uh, projects. And then uh, monitoring assessment, uh, yeah, it, it should be done at the three levels. Uh, you have the donor, uh, like the, the European Union itself, of course, to see if, if it uh, brings something to, to uh, our policy. Then you have the implementers who should also make uh, a kind of, uh, after each project, uh, a decent uh, assessment. And then last but not least, uh, also the beneficiary should, should uh, tell us uh, if a project was successful and uh, if, we should, if, if we should repeat it uh, or not. So this, this in a nutshell, uh, some first uh, remarks on the, the conclusions. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Philippe. Uh, uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, I would now just like to turn it very quickly back to uh, our three um, panelists from the PREVEX project to see if they have some uh, immediate um, reactions to what they have heard from the um, two representatives uh, from the union. So, um, uh, uh, Stephen, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, thanks, Martin, and also thanks, uh, Anna and, and Philip, for your for your helpful comments and, and additions. We miss indeed, you know, sitting in the ivory tower. Uh, we miss some of you know the juice um, that you can certainly provide to, um, uh, to to fleshing out, you know, our our own research. But what strikes me is um, perhaps at a meta level, and um, my colleagues uh, Diana and Eric will no doubt um, venture a little bit further into uh, the regional approaches. But what, what, stri what strikes me is that um, as far as the, the Balkans are concerned, of course, there is a clear membership perspective, uh, a pre-accession methodology in which um, CT uh, and CVE uh, relevant activities and projects have been uh, deployed. 
um, at the same time, there seems to be um, they seem to be framed also by by local realities, uh, whereby the EU has not, as of yet, been able to significantly uh, significantly move the needle. And I'm, I'm especially focused on on rule of law uh, reform in this uh, respect, and also the the wide socioeconomic gap which still exists between um, the uh, the Balkan six and um, the the average EU uh, income. Which, of course, define realities as to what the EU can uh, can achieve, and I I wonder to what extent uh, these these gaps have widened, in fact, over the last couple of years. Whether you could say anything about that, I apart from Albania, which which has gone through a very radical rule of law, uh, justice reform, justice sector reform um, process in the last couple of years, it would seem to me that there's been a regression in what were previously called the front runners in this process, Serbia, um, Montenegro, um, perhaps less so in, uh, in North Macedonia, uh, which of course, uh, given the, the zero sum gaming polit politics um, of these countries um, may curb some of the effect that CT or CVE relevant projects can really produce. Um, uh, for for those particular areas in which we're uh, about which we're concerned, and the, and the socioeconomic gap, of course, which may have uh, widened. I mean, talking about tackling root causes for violent extremism, perhaps not only of an Islamist kind, but perhaps also of a an Orthodox um, uh, Christian side, or indeed from uh, from the far right um, or far left, for the, for that matter, uh, groupings. Does the COVID threat of increased unemployment, which is skyrocketing as a result of the, the, the major economic uh, impact which COVID will, uh, will create, um, not just in this region, but, uh, but also in, uh, in, in the MENA region, um, lead to further immigration from those countries to the European Union, thereby risking, of course, um, uh, again, the spillover that uh, that you've talked about, bringing it back to our original point, which Eric also emphasizes, that our first, the EU's first uh, interest driving this entire process uh, process is the protection of itself, its borders, and its citizens, thereby risking again this further secretarization uh, dynamic that we've already uh, highlighted. I was just wondering whether you have any thoughts on those uh, widening gaps, as I perceive them at least. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, let's now hear also from uh, Diana and uh, Eric. Uh, Diana first, please. Thank you very much, both to Anna and Philip for this very useful, indeed, um, uh, very, very useful. Uh, comments and complimenting um, uh, all of our original survey. Um, there's, there's here a major methodological uh, issue, which I think we should, we should tackle at some, uh, at some length. Um, on the one hand, as Eric pointed out, there is no consensual understanding, let alone definition of what violent extremism is what. What uh, is uh, the, 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 uh, the most appropriate approach to violent uh, extremism and terrorism uh, is on the European level? At the same time, there are clearly voices that would like to see the extension of um, um, the roof under which various kinds of extremism must be uh, sheltered. And uh, aren't we then facing, uh, I mean, given these two, two, uh, <coughs> two definitions, on the one hand, lack of definition, on the other hand, the urge to the necessity perhaps to include a large variety of, uh, of uh, you know, extremist actions, would that not dissipate the possibility of any meaningful research being done? And how, how are we to envisage uh, uh, measures that would enable uh, to, to uh, 
congratulations and be able to trust both, both uh, let's say, Islamist violent extremism and other forms of extreme right and extreme left extremism. But this is a very ideological issue to me uh, that, that um, uh, I think we should we should face before before we proceed. I'm particularly grateful to Anna's comment uh, about the diaspora. Here another question actually arises, namely, uh, are we able to, to check what exactly uh, uh, active radicalization takes place? Is it more at home? Is it more homegrown in the Western Balkans? Or is it primarily driven by, uh, by the diaspora? And the links, the links between internal and and external. Um, we hear me because my speaker doesn't seem. It gives me some. Do you hear me? The line was very uh, and was very shaky. Uh, the it was line. very maybe, shaky. It's maybe uh, I'm sorry, to... Dana. Probably I have to I have to restart my computer. Uh, would you would you be patient? Hold uh, just bear with me for a while. I think with uh, Diana, please try, try to restart your computer. Uh, and while you do that, uh, I'll turn to Eric and then I put you on again when you have restarted your computer. Okay. okay. Eric, would you be so kind to take over? Of course. Uh, so first of all, thank you to Philip and Anna for our very enlightening comments. Uh, I mean, if there's anything to say, I would like to note that the preceding critical assessment is not intended, was not intended to deny the great variety of EU PVE funding projects uh, and initiatives. Um, I mean, as noted, the EU has implemented programs working with Syrian children or strengthening youth empowerment or facilitating media literacy in Jordan. Uh, and also, as noted, it, uh, the PVE efforts do to, uh, to a great extent depend on what key partners and regimes in the region allow the EU to do. So when, when, I, come, when I came forth as uh, perhaps quite critical of the EU's PVE efforts in the Middle East, it should, we do not suggest that the programs are not important, important, but rather that it should be read as an acknowledgement of the difficulties with which the EU must navigate when it cooperates and negotiates with local, uh, with local stakeholders, key partners and governments that essentially do not share the normative values of the EU. Um, so, I, I mean, if I would very much uh, like to hear, if, if possible, and if we have the time to hear from Philip and Anna about cooperating with, um, with uh, key partners in the region when it comes to PVE, if possible. Uh, because I, I can, uh, with some foreshadowing, one of the, comp uh, the one of the conclusions in our policy brief is that securitization as a PVE approach in the Middle East is a contradiction in terms, as long as it secures the stability of MENA regimes, as they are a precondition for violent extremism in the region. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, of course, we have the time to uh, hear back from uh, Philippe and uh, Anna, but let me also go to just quickly run through some uh, questions that have come as we uh, talk. Uh, the first one uh, is in terms of typologies of Islamist groups present in Europe. Have you concluded your analysis? And if so, is there a comprehensive list of the ramification of these groups in Europe? Let me just tackle this because Prevex is not studying Islamic groups in Europe per se. I mean, we are the, the, the objective of this project is to contribute to our understanding of violent extremism and how it best can be prevented and what uh, and how well fitted the EU strategies and other external stakeholder strategies are in the Western Balkans and in the broader MENA region. So we are not uh, studying or making a typology of Islamist groups present in Europe. 
maybe some of the panelists would like to uh, offer some thoughts about this, but at least this is sort of from a project perspective. I mean, um, this is not what we are studying. Uh, there is an interesting question, uh, question here, or whether there is any strategy in place with regard to foreign fighters that left to Ukraine. Maybe somebody would like to touch upon that. Uh, there is a question on de-radicalization. I mean, uh, uh, pointing to the fact uh, that the perpetrator of the recent terrorist attack in Vienna was under uh, a de-radicalization program in Austria. This was touched upon uh, in some of the uh, uh, comments, uh, but. Here is all the question of how can one design successful programs and what could be the contribution of the EU on that? Um, here, I mean, we could uh, also draw in uh, some of the analytical language from Brevex uh, talking about uh, that radicalization is not necessarily a monolithic uh, identity, but uh, also at times a situational post that people move in and out of which may have consequences for how you think about de-radicalization. Uh, then there is a question for uh, Anna uh, about uh, how do you think that the EU gender mainstreaming can be better aligned with local uh, level needs? I think that's a question that uh, hopefully also other would be interested in, um, um, in tackling. Uh, again, for Anna, but also for other what she thinks uh, of the role of INSEN in the EU CT strategy. And finally, does the EU differentiate between PVE and CVE two, or does the EU see PVE and CVE at, uh, at the one end of the spectrum and uh, counterterrorism at the other? So th these are some of the questions that have come up uh, during, the, um, um, during the presentations. So, um, I would allow uh, the panelists also to tackle uh, some of these ones. Um, but first, uh, maybe we should hear now uh, quickly back from, uh, from uh, Anna and Philip, uh, both uh, the responses we have heard from the Prevex panelists, but also if you have some thoughts uh, concerning some of the questions that has emerged during the discussion. So maybe mm. you would like to start, uh, Anna? Yeah, thank you. H before beauty, as I say to Philippe. Um, um, right. Uh, going to what Diana said about the diaspora, this it's a mix. Radicalization is not a one-stop shop, as we all know. Some are radicalized solely online, but very often it's more in an in-person thing. But what the reason I say this diaspora link, because we know this very much from, from our intelligence services, both locally and in the EU, is that the the, the la la radicalization has been conducted in a specific language, which is not French or German. It's been done in Albanian or in, in Bosniak or uh, uh, et cetera. That's why we know it. Uh, but I mean, one part, which is a very, very sensitive subject for the EU, of course, is also the influence of third party, we call it third party influences. And I'm not talking about TikTok here, we're talking about third, uh, Gulf, Gulf states that influence through through funding, through cultural centers, through other means, uh, who invites uh, people to uh, go on uh, or attend a particular uh, Salafi type um, imam training, etc., etc., etc. And this is something, from a policy point of view, which is very tricky for us, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, but other people, services are called or how, keep an eye on this uh, more than we are. And, and it's a very difficult situation for the Western Balkans because they also come in with them big investments in hotels, uh, in businesses, etc. And then there are some side businesses perhaps that are less kosher, which is a concern. Uh, going to some of the questions here, uh, PCV, CV, I mean, you can call it what you want. There is no fundamental proper uh, definition of um, whether it's preventing of violent estimates, it's less aggressive, countering sounds a bit harsher. So we move to PVE then. But in the UN talk context, we have huge debates because many countries, notably Egypt, Russia, a few others, uh, Turkey, um, wants to talk about violent extremism leading to terrorism. So that's in fact as good as it got with the UN definition of this. Uh, and uh, which, which is not what we use in the EU. 
vis-a-vis -vis, uh, foreign terrorist fighters that went to Donetsk in, in eastern Ukraine? Yes, this is a very good question, uh, notably from Serbia and a few, very few from, from Montenegro. Uh, they have mostly returned. Our biggest concern there is that they were very well trained to use weapons. Uh, and at the beginning, they were treated as almost, uh, you know, some heroes that had returned home and got done a good deed. Now we, they have actually been some prosecutions. So Serbia has in particular turned their, 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 you know, they have changed their policy on this. Uh, there were some questions on gender. Look, I'm no expert here. I, I used to say uh, to my own government, which is always funny considering how strong they're on gender policies, that Daesh is a very, gender balanced organization is 60% men, 40% women, um, uh, truthfully. So uh, women in our view should be prosecuted, have the committed terrorism crime. But when it comes to the gender aspects of de-radicalization, et cetera, one have to use other type, and this we see also from the EU member states, other type of methods because they're already quite stigmatized or can be stigmatized when they come back to the community. So that's what I mean in, the, in that aspect. Um, and, and I can't go into really specificities. All PV and de-radicalization, et cetera, is all very context specific. So it's very hard to draw, uh, to give, give on this short notice some specific. And we have other colleagues that are experts on this. Uh, then there was a question about topologies of Islamist groups present in Europe. Yes, there, there are plenty of research of that uh, um, from other organizations. And, it, um, it, and then there was something as regards incense in the EU city strategy. Yeah, so just to talk briefly about the 9th December package. So this is, of course, internal. This is EU member state, has a tiny few paragraphs on external. So this is inside the European Union. So, however, when you use stronger capabilities of biometric data at the borders vis-a-vis -vis third partners, of course, it affects the external. It's external threat going inwards. So this is what we're trying to aim for. INSEN um, um, is not an intelligence agency. It consists of experts from member states who draws up analysis for us, for me, Philip, and others based on member states assessment and then they make an eu assessment of it which should um, inform our policy going forward so incen is already plays a big role with dg home and, and uh, uh, primarily dg home etc dg ne and others based on what their analysis is but there's not an intelligence agency it's not uh, operational in that respect at all um i think that's answered uh, most of the question was something about uh, what did you say, Eric, about uh, men uh, for something specific you asked? Uh, you're on mute. So um, my main point is that uh, my main point was that one of the uh, to foreshadow the policy brief is that uh, one of our conclusion is that uh, the regimes in the MENA region are one of the preconditions yeah, yeah. for the growth of violent extremism, the mm. lack of good governance, human mm. rights, etc. Yeah. So um, my question was mainly, how does the EU view cooperating with regimes on preventing violent extremism that themselves, I mean, it for us, it seemed, for our working group, it seems that securitization in MENA is a contradiction in terms. Mm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think you're, you're, you're spot on there in, in many aspects. And you mentioned Egypt before. I mean, uh, Egypt is a country where we do not have a seat advice in the delegation because they refuse. Uh, however, Egypt is very active with us in the Global Counterterrorism Forum, for example. E Egypt is, uh, has another main target, which is not Daesh. They have Muslim Brotherhood, so they have another outlook on threats. Um, but, I mean, there is an overall... Um, Secretarization uh, and lack of rule of law in certain countries, but I think you can you can apply the same uh, worry also to other regions, uh, more democratic regions. The lack of uh, rule of law, or for the Western Balkan context, the corruption, the lack of opportunities, that there is a collapse of of for youth in particular opportunity to to I mean when we look at the, the vulnerable villages in certain countries there, 
there they don't live in the best of circumstances uh, these villages have been quite exposed they can't afford school books there's no bus to go anywhere else i mean these are very very poor regions not all of them but, but many uh, so you're an easy vulnerable target and i think i hope philip will jump in on this now also what COVID has done in terms of risk we have seen a huge uptake on online radicalization during COVID because most people, those who have, can afford a computer, spend more time online or, or a mobile phone. And of course, it's an opportune moment to learn more people into this. If it's only online, it takes place because we don't meet so much now and there's less terrorist targets. But of course, uh, what we can do just to finalize is that's why Philippe says rightly, we call it PVE related programs because in some countries it's very sensitive to talk to PVE full stop. So Egypt, um, the Middle East, I would say, for example, or even Turkey. So, but if you talk about youth programs, they have no problem with that. Do, does youth program prevent radicalization? You bet. So you, it serves the same purpose, but you don't have to call it PVE. So that's all we can do. We need to emphasize the role of civil society, which is very important for the European Union. Whether it, and then, of course, if we expose civil society organization to grave risk, we have to think twice. If they're going to get arrested the next day, if they get receive funding from us, uh, it's not, it's not, it's a no, non-starter. But you have a good point there. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and I'm going to turn to Philippe, but I, I, since you mentioned COVID-19, uh, and I, I would just like to uh, state that um, even if it was not part of one of our uh, deliverables in this pro project, I mean, Prevex has put together a sort of re research note series on uh, COVID-19 and uh, radicalization, uh, uh, both in the Western Balkans and in the, in the MENA region, uh, and the, these research notes are available both on the um, uh, Prevex webpage, but also uh, they have been uploaded uh, to a new server in the Commission for uh, the upload of th those kind of uh, research papers. So we have done some work on it. Uh, but uh, let me now turn to Philippe before I, in the end, give the, uh, my three uh, fellow uh, Prevex panelists uh, a chance to sort of uh, round this up. But Philippe, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I think Anna uh, took uh, most uh, of the answers uh, already. But uh, just to come back to Ukraine, uh, yes, it, it, it's a fact that in the region uh, there are no strategies uh, within the authorities for people coming back from Ukraine, fighters coming back from Ukraine. Uh, there is a change. There was a change some years ago because uh, some before some years uh, these people were even not sentenced and, and they were not coming before court. Now, systematically, uh, and in Serbia and also in Bosnia, there were uh, even recent uh, convictions of uh, people uh, coming back uh, from Ukraine, fighters coming back from uh, Ukraine. But uh, to be clear, uh, no, there are no uh, resocialization or reintegration programs for this kind of people. Uh, and we have these resocialization strategies. We have them uh, in the six, uh, the Western Balkan six. We have them for those who are coming back from Syria and Iraq. And uh, as we are, uh, we as European Union, we are supporting uh, the strategies uh, from the Western Balkan six for those who are coming back from Syria and Iraq. But we never uh, received any uh, request or demand for assistance uh, for those uh, coming back from uh, Ukraine, uh, simply because these these strategies and action plans are are not uh, existing so far. Maybe this will come, but but so far uh, this will come. Then uh, there was a semantic discussion about uh, preventing uh, violent extremism, countering violent extremism. Uh, within the European Union, uh, we don't go too much in this discussion. We, uh, PCVE is like the preventive side before something is happening. We call it PCVE in one word. And uh, once we are on the repressive side, uh, we are uh, working once an attack is, is committed, that we are calling uh, countering uh, terrorism. But uh, don't... Uh, search it that that far c p v e okay for us it's 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 in the prevention side so so we are uh, yeah and then uh, yeah 
to come back uh, to COVID. Yes, indeed, in the Western Balkan, uh, we have to say that, especially in the beginning of the COVID period, uh, the attention of the authorities was far from CT and CVE because they had other priorities, uh, clearly. But we have uh, pushed a lot, uh, almost on a daily basis. And I can tell you now that, that uh, the authorities uh, have put CT and CVE back on, on the agenda. Uh, and they are, uh, let's say, restarting with uh, implementing their own strategies and also uh, their uh, commitments uh, within the six CT arrangements between the EU and the Western Balkan. Then maybe to react on what uh, Stephen was saying, a socio-economic situation, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's extremely important. And uh, no, uh, if, if we are looking uh, 20 years later after uh, the war here, uh, not a lot has changed on the socio-economic side. Uh, on the other side, uh, it's not only the socio-economic environment who is uh, making of somebody an extremist or a radicalist but of course there are certain links and as you know there was a lot of research about uh, foreign terrorist fighters leaving and extremists push factors pull factors uh, okay socio-economic factors unemployment no future uh, no uh, opportunities as youngsters uh, it plays a role and, and that's uh, Anna mentioned it all and that these uh, PCVE relevant uh, projects are so important. Uh, but it's not only that, it, it, it's more, uh, we always will have, and then we are not talking only about Islamic extremists, but also on, on the right side, you have a minority who will uh, become or who are extremists, who have radical ideas. This is a minority, regardless of their situation, their socio-economic situation. And these ones are, are the tough ones uh, to work against. But maybe the, a majority of potential candidates uh, can be saved by a good economic, socio-economic situation and, and uh, programs. So this, this is all I have, I have to say uh, so far. Thank you, Philip. Uh, let me know uh, we have more or less seven minutes left. So let me turn uh, back to the, my three fellow Prevex uh, researchers. Uh, uh, I hope also that uh, Diana has been able to reconnect. But let's start with uh, you, Stephen. Any final reflections? Thanks, Martin. Uh, yeah, two, two final reflections, perhaps. Um, I mean, first, the, the coordination between the EU and the Western Balkans is, of course, good, um, especially at a high level, um, whereas it seems that some of our research findings actually show at the local level, this content is, uh, is spreading. Uh, but perhaps Diana can say something more about that. I mean, Western Balkan governments are, of course, prone to cooperate with the European Union, are willing to stop the violence, irrespective of all the other problems um, that they may face or the, the divergences in policies that may occur in, in other areas. Um, and there's, of course, this, this power equation uh, defined by a prospect, however elusive, uh, of, of accession to the European Union. So there's a clear interest to work in a spirit of trust. Um, the EU, on the other hand, needs MENA countries' uh, collaboration. I mean, the, the power equilibrium there is the opposite, uh, one could argue, from, from that of the Western Balkans. There's an absence of an enlargement perspective, no real power of attraction uh, to the EU. So I think th this is something we always have to keep in, uh, in mind when, uh, when, we, when we study these issues across regions. The second um, uh, point which, which comes out of this uh, discussion is that, well, the, the focus is firmly back on terrorism, it seems, uh, especially after the attacks in France and in Austria. Um, the, traditionally, of course, uh, because of the waves of immigration and transition through, uh, geographically, that is, of foreign fighters, um, CT and PVE, PCVE uh, strategies are focused on, on those groups uh, and their, their uh, offspring, if you want. But there is a growing risk of, of paramilitarization of, um, of extreme groupings in the region themselves, which may create problems across the borders. Um, football hooligans, of course, the alt-right, uh, violence condoned by the Orthodox uh, Church. And in this case, uh, the possibility of the government being on the same line of the extreme 
political groupings um, and and thereby um, create another spanner in the works for uh, for EU approaches in dealing with on a governmental level basis at least uh, about on these issues. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Diana, have you been able to reconnect with us? Well, I hope so. Maybe you'll tell me if there is some, some still some problems with the. No, you uh, sound uh, nice and clear now. Good. Let's see. Uh, now, a few things. Thanks again for, for these remarks and, and comments. Uh, I was trying to, to keep note of, of most of them. Uh, one important issue, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we might have to still claim that the Western Balkans coordination is much better. However, uh, it seems to me that this also goes with some ups and downs. In the sense that, that um, um, it's uh, it much less efficient in the case of Serbia than in the case of, uh, let's say, uh, North Macedonia and uh, Albania. Uh, for example, um, it is known that the EU had insisted on integrating, including right-wing uh, extremism in the strategic documents um, of Serbia. However, it is also um, on the other hand, in the case of Albania and North Macedonia, precisely because they are in this pre-accession, that is pre-negotiation uh, period, uh, this kind of resistance, I mean, of, of, of uh, Reflecting all these issues via the rule of law has been much more, much more successful. So, obviously, we we'll have to, to uh, distinguish between between different uh, different players here. I should say that our um, our uh, Bosnian and our Serbian uh, partners have been very emphatic about the importance of right wing and radical act of nationalism in is in all these uh, contexts. And both of them have raised the issue of the Ukrainian returnees and the fact uh, of local governments deliberately uh, sidestepping, ignoring, neglecting these uh, this, uh, this issues. But here again, as I said, it, is, it, is, it will be very useful if we can uh, discuss probably within the Prevex framework, how we can integrate these uh, different varieties of, of uh, violent extremism, because there are, to my mind, multiple issues here to be, to be seriously tackled. It is not the same thing to, to deal with um, radical ethno-nationalism and Islamist nationalism. So we have yeah, I'm sorry, but your connection is again. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you, sorry. You fade sorry in and this. out. At one moment sorry you are uh, crystal clear, and then uh, the line starts uh, breaking up again. I'm very sorry about it. Uh, but me I too. Think me too. Me too. But okay, let's let's Eric take take over. Thank you, Eric. Please. Uh, thank you, Morten. Well, I, I don't have any particular concluding remarks uh, besides uh, noting or referring to Dr. Blockman's um, uh, suggestion on the dependence on MENA countries. And uh, if there's anything to say or of conclusive remarks, it would be that many of the EU representatives we have talked to say that the EU has no leverage when it, when it comes to coordinating, cooperating, or negotiating with MENA regimes. Uh, we will come back to this later in the Prevex project, but right now I, it suffices to say that uh, our opinion is that the MENA countries depend far more on the EU than vice versa. And if the EU wants to have a far more effective policy in the MENA region, it would be to, either, if not cut, then at least decrease funding to these regimes. Thank you. Thanks, Eric, and thank to all the participants. And particularly, I would like to thank uh, Anna and Philip who, um, who uh, so um, gracefully uh, took off their time to contribute to our discussions. I mean, we are deeply thankful for that. I think you really provided us with a lot of uh, input that we need 
both for our research, but it also the conversation uh, that we have had with you had, has certainly helped to clarify my thinking. And I think that's the same uh, goes for uh, my um, fellow uh, Prevex uh, colleagues on this panel. So uh, without further ado, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists. I would like to thank, thank the audience. Uh, I would also like to thank the European Union who's, uh, who has funded or given us um, the trust of funding this project, uh, given us um, the year of uh, research funding. Uh, we are one year into it. We look forward to the continuation. We hope that we will be able to really start with a more sort of in-depth field work as we pass into 2021 and hopefully the COVID situation will also make it easier for us to do this research. Um, the, the project is set up as a, with a lot of collaborative ties between the researchers uh, within EU countries and the researchers in what we may call the, 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 the case-specific countries. We have colleagues on the ground in all the Western Balkan countries that uh, Diana was talking about. We have colleagues on the ground in, uh, in Morocco, in uh, Mali and Niger and in, um, in Iraq and several other places uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Middle East. Um, and uh, right now we have been spending time since March discussing with them on various e-platforms. And uh, I do very much look forward to the day when we can start working together with these excellent researchers that we have around in this Previx universe on the ground together. Um, so we have a field intensive phase that we hope, hope we will be able to kickstart as soon as possible the next year. Uh, and I'm certain, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. And we look also forward to come back to you, uh, to, um, to stakeholders in the union, in the commission, but also to uh, um, the concerned uh, audience in Europe with uh, new findings, uh, new sort of uh, information from the ground. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you. But for now, thanks to everybody that contributed to, uh, to the debate, certainly enlightening um, for us and hopefully also for our audience. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Morten, uh, may I ask that, that uh, the, I mean, Probably Stephen and Eric already left, but may I ask that the Prevex team holds on for a while or, I mean, it's too late, maybe. <laughs> maybe not, they have disappeared. Not necessarily, but I think they are, they are still on live uh, on YouTube. So we need 